on my little book. I have a little book that I wrote all the stories. Ah, uh, here it is, here it is. <clears throat> um, let's see. <clears throat> All right, here, I'll tell you a good story. There was a pupil <coughs> that learned by us in the yeshiva. This is, I guess, five years ago. His name was five years ago, four years ago. His name was, uh, what was it? Botnik. Was it Daniel Botnik? I don't know. Really terrible. Anyway, so um, th this was a whole group of fellows that were brought to the yeshiva by somebody. He said that he knew how to deal with them. Anyway, it was a whole big, long story. And these boys learned in the yeshiva, and they were much more wild. These were like sort of the, uh, the uh, anyway, they came from Chabad families, but they were really wild, and they really didn't want too much to do with Judaism. But they sort of, you know, had, <clears throat> had doubts of their own estimations and their own, <clears throat> you know, their own opinions. Anyway, so it ended up that they learned here, and then when they finished, then that's it. But I sort of kept in contact with some of them. One of them told me, one of them, a couple of them, they went into the Israeli army. As far as I know, they've all become religious, as far as I know. But anyway, so they, uh, one of them went into the army, and he told me an interesting story, that he was home. He was home, and he had already pretty much stopped putting on tefillin. Maybe I shouldn't have said his name, but in any case... So he had, he had pretty much, you know, stopped putting on tefillin. All these fellows, they were, you know, no big deal for them to for just live a normal life, you know. They have to put on tefillin for. So <clears throat> he had pretty much stopped. But he, so he was going to go to the army. This was like a week before he was in America and he was going to fly to Israel. So it was, and it was, it was a combat unit. So his father was a little bit apprehensive, you know, and he also... <clears throat> So he asked Igros Kodesh. And in Igros Kodesh, there was a letter to someone who was going to go into the army. And the, the Rebbe told him to be careful to put on his tefillin. He had to put on tefillin. So he figured, okay, you know, he told me the story. This is this. He told me the story, what was it? I think two years ago he told me the story. So he said, okay. So he took his tefillin with him. I think he took both pairs of tefillin, Rashi and Rabbeinu Tam. Now also in Chabad, we have sort of big tefillin, you know, so it's <clears throat> putting it in your, in your suitcase or whatever is no big deal. But when you're in the army, you know, it's not so easy, especially a lot of times they would, uh, you know, take like uh, the marches and training in the forests, wherever they were. And this, <clears throat> you know, this basic training, you had to take your tefillin with you all the time. It was not so easy. But he did it. You know, he, he, the letter said you have to take your tefillin with you wherever you are. <clears throat> so when, whenever they would have like a break, so like I said, he went into a combat unit. So combat unit, the training is, is difficult. And they have what they call a masa kumta. They have a, like a three-day march where they march for three days and they, you know, they sleep almost nothing. And they sleep like standing up and walking. People put their hand in them to teach them to get, you know, adapted to extreme conditions. So, so when they would do this, they would give them like, you know, 10 minutes of rest time. So a lot of times the only chance you would have to put on tefillin was in this 10 minutes of rest time that he had. You know, they woke them up early in the morning before the sun came up. And so you didn't have any time to put on tefillin, you know, before you couldn't wake up earlier than everybody else because it was already, it was nighttime. So every time that he had a chance, he had like five minutes free or three minutes free or whatever, 10 minutes free, he would put on tefillin. So all the other, these were all Jews, right? But they were all Jews that had basically left Judaism. And the army in Israel, you should know, I mean, as far as Judaism goes, it's terrible. It's just, it's just terrible. There are some units which are like, you know, religious, totally religious units. They go all... To themselves, but the generally speaking, you know, Chabad is sort of an exception, sort of an exception. They manage to survive. 
Jewish Judaism, Judaism wise, the army, but the army was, you know, one of the big, it's not a nice thing to say, but one of the big goals of the army was to take people away from Judaism, to put the women in together with the men and make people normal. We'll be normal soldiers. That was a very big, right? not, let's talk about positive things, but that was anyway. So a lot of that still remains in the army. You know, they're more open nowadays. They're more, you know, uh, <clears throat> they're more, how do you call it, the, the approachable about things about Judaism. In any case, generally that same attitude, but for the fighting soldiers, for sure. So he would, whenever there was a time to, everyone would just take, take a couple of seconds of precious, you know, time to sit down and sleep or do something. And he would put on tefillin. So the other fellows made fun of him. What are you nuts? You're crazy out of your mind. You know, you're, you're putting on tefillin. It's a waste of time. Putting on tefillin takes, you know, minimum three minutes, four minutes. It's precious time. You have to take them out. That's already five minutes. Put them back together. <clears throat> and um, so they made fun of him. That was in the beginning. He said, but after a few days, as one of them, they saw him put on tefillin and they said, let me put on also. They would put on also. So like at one break, he would put on, one break, somebody else would put on. And eventually, I guess some of them, that, it ended up that all of them were putting on tefillin, all of them. They had, some of them had their own, some of them borrowed from other people, they did it in whatever it is. In, but because of this letter of the Rebbe, so they broke nature, their own natures, and the human nature. Person wants to rest, he wants to, right? And, they, and they, all of them were putting on tefillin just because of this letter of the Rebbe. So that's a little bit like the chauffeur Gadol the sound of the big shofar. Because I guarantee you, not one of these boys was putting on tefillin in order to go to heaven or to avoid hell. That had absolutely no relevance to their personalities. Right? These were brave young men that were you know, thinking about life. And suddenly they realized that Judaism is something that's really alive, really good, really important. You can give a few minutes to the creator of the universe. So that's, I'll just tell you one more short story. If we're already telling a story, there was a fellow, I think that his name was Didi Sharon, I think. He was a pilot in the Israeli army, the Air Force. He once spoke in the yeshiva, he spoke to the boys. This is a long time ago, must have been 20 years ago. And he said, how did he become religious? That he was walking down the street one day. He was a pilot, usually in Israel, the Air Force, the pilots, they're the most non-religious. They're the most anti-religious. Because usually in the Air Force, these people have to be of a higher IQ, and they consider themselves to be superior people. And in a way, I guess they are, you know, as far as fighting goes, they're, you know, any case. So, but in any case, usually, genuinely speaking, these people were not religious at all. They were anti-religious. So he's walking down the street, but they're good. They're nice people. They're nice people. Don't think for one second. They, 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 they do anything to help another person. <clears throat> just amazing. It's just that to them, Judaism has absolutely nothing to do with being a nice person or being a human being. Exactly the opposite. It makes you, you know, separated from the world and closed in this little black sort of box or something. So that's what they didn't want to have anything to do with. Judaism. So he's walking down the street one day. This is the story he tells us. He's walking down the street one day, and he sees a big sign in a Chabad house. It's a Chabad house. I think where it was in Ranana or somewhere in Tel Aviv. And it says, Do your duty and put on tefillin. Now his whole life is motivated by what is my duty? I'll do it. You know, he goes to the armies, and the army is risking his life. It's his duty to protect the country, to protect the, 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 the inhabitants. It's his duty, does his duty. So he passes by and it says, do your duty, put on tefillin. So he couldn't figure out what was going on, you know, and he saw this picture of the certain nice looking religious old man. So he went in and there were nice people there. He said, excuse me, can you tell me what is the sign? What do you mean, do my duty? <clears throat> what type of a duty do I have? to put on tefillin. I mean, I'm, I'm in the Air Force. I'm risking my life 
that's my duty. They said, you're, it's true, of course you're, <laughs> you're, what's the question? That certainly is your duty, but that's not your only duty. Right? You're a Jew. You have a duty to the creator of the universe to put on tefillin. He said, you sure? It's, this is my duty. They say, if it's my duty, then I'll do it. And he believed it. He believed it. And in the end, he saw that, yes, it is. You know, it's true. It's my duty. And it, and it makes you feel really good and responsible and human when you do your duty. <clears throat> so it's the same, that's the, what has motivated these young men to put on tefillin as well. See you all at three o'clock, I hope. We'll all be together three o'clock.